You ever heard the song that goes, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever cares and loves his own. As you hear these words, I wonder if you're receiving what I'm receiving. Some problems are just too much for me to bear alone. Some trials are just too hard, too tough for me to try and navigate a way out. There are some things that come up in our marriages, things that come up in our families, at our jobs, in our lives, that we simply must tell Jesus about. In your distress, in your sorrow and confusion, let me encourage you to run and tell Jesus. Tell him my marriage isn't going great right now. I need you to help me fix it, Lord. Tell him my job is stressful. This isn't what I had in mind to do for the rest of my life. I need new opportunities, Lord. I need a better job. Run and tell Jesus that my family isn't getting along. There's a lot of unforgiveness and bitterness that's separating us. I need you to bring healing, Father. Make it a practice. Make it a routine to run and tell Jesus. And just like the song says, he will kindly help you. He does care for you. He does love his own. So take your problems to Jesus. We struggle so much when we hold on to our burdens. We try to bear them alone thinking we can fix it. Thinking we can somehow find the solution to life's unpredictable sorrows, but it's not for us to struggle alone. After all, we are not our own. We have a friend in Jesus who gave us an open invitation. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. So take your problems to Jesus, for he cares for us. He asks us to cast our burdens on him so he can sustain us. Daily, he will renew our strength. In the face of adversity, we don't have to bear our burdens alone. Tell God about your troubles. He said he will give you rest. Do not allow the idol of self-reliance to entrap you. Break free. Claim your rest in Jesus. Everyone's situations vary because we all have things that we are praying and asking God for. Some of us want our family saved, others a better job, success in business, a spouse, healing, financial deliverance, a house, a child, and the list goes on and on. Some circumstances are so dire that it may even seem that the odds are stacked against you and the problem is insurmountable. If you can only think back to something God has already done for you, you can encourage yourself in the Lord and work your faith. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What an amazing promise. At different points in my life, and even now, I have to go back and contemplate on what the Lord has already done. I can ponder on the times that he helped me pass a test in college or healed me of an illness, giving me that job I've prayed for and even granted me the little things that I've asked for. After each battle, my faith grew more and more. We as children of God have to learn to flex our faith muscles and use faith everywhere and all the time. We should use our faith not just for tiny things, but big things. Don't be afraid to ask God for big things. We serve the God that called time into being. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 and 32, But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Have you ever judged yourself? Have you ever critiqued your own life? Have you ever honestly and objectively assessed? Does my faith please God? Am I a faithful believer 
to the Lord? Do I seek first the kingdom of God? Am I really bearing good fruit? You see, self-reflection is important in every area of life, and it's particularly important in a believer's life. But the demands of this life can keep us from self-reflection. You see, life has a way of pushing us forward by all its demands. But it's so important for us to look into the mirror and hold up the standard, which is the Word of God, and then compare ourselves and see how do we match up. Because if the Bible says, pray without ceasing, but you can clearly see in your own life that you don't pray, well then, now you have something to go before God about. Now you have a prayer request, which should be, Lord, help me to pray consistently. Do you see how self-reflection can help you? God wants us to be real and honest, and he wants us to look closely into that mirror from time to time and examine ourselves. How's our character? What's our lifestyle like? Are we living in a manner that is pleasing to God? Are we gaining victory over those private battles that we all face? Now here's why the Word of God is powerful. When you read it, it acts like, like a mirror. And when you read God's Word, you need to be asking yourself, is this real to me? Am I living this truth in my life? James chapter 1 verse 22 to 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The challenge is to be a doer of the word rather than just hearing about God's word. Saints, when we go before God, with a heart humbled and surrendered, that's where transformation can take place in His presence. It's a place where we can be honest about what we're lacking and where we need to improve. Have you ever been in a situation where you've trusted someone? A friend, a colleague, a husband or wife, and they've let you down? Too often, we trust in everyone else, in everything else but the one who will never let us down, and that is Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. The Bible reads, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, in whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. To fully trust in God, we have to relinquish your need for control. You have to let go of the need to want to know what happens next. To put it another way, to fully trust in the Lord is to abandon trust in yourself or in any other person. You stop trying to fix it yourself and you allow God to have his way. You stop trying to influence the outcome and instead you yield to the Lord and surrender all control to him. And to do that in this day and age is to go against everything we're taught and trained to do. We're expected to stay on top of those emails at work. We have to take control of our career and our business. We need to take control of our kids' futures and education. We need to control this and that. 
So much of our lives today requires control. But the Lord operates differently when it comes to the aspect of control. Now, I'm not saying you should neglect your responsibilities. What I am saying is that you should do your part and leave room for the Lord to act. And so what does that mean? It means you show up to work with a right attitude and you work hard. But you don't start fighting over a promotion or position because you think you deserve it. God sees your faithfulness. Surrender to Him and let Him be in control. Don't become jealous when you think you deserve something more. It's in those situations that you need to relinquish control and stop trying to fix it yourself, but hand it over to the Lord. And so in all aspects of your life, you need to accept that in the grand scheme of things, your control is limited. What you can control is your effort on a daily basis. How much time you spend in prayer on a daily basis. That's what you can control. As for the rest, you have to leave it up to God. Pray that God intervenes in that situation with your boss or supervisor. Pray that God steps in when it comes to who your kids are influenced by at school. Pray that the Lord will see your hard work and reward you. Remember what the Bible says. You are blessed when you place your trust in God. You are blessed when you place your hope in Jesus. Try and picture this scene in Matthew 24, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, as the Lord answered, he said something interesting in verse 4. The Bible says Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. Really think about what's being said there. Watch out that no one deceives you. That tells us that one of the signs of the coming of Christ is that deception in this world will be high. And so for us, the only way that we can avoid being led astray by false teachings, false doctrines, imitators of Christ, is if we know the Lord for ourselves. Develop a personal relationship with God so that no one can deceive you. When you experience the real thing, you are quick to notice when something is off about a preacher. You're quick to notice what kind of atmosphere is in a place. You can notice, you can discern what spirit is in operation. Whether it is the spirit of God or if as 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. When you know God, When you experience the Lord for yourself, you are able to discern and watch out that no one deceives you. So I encourage you to search for an experience with God. The Word of God says in Jeremiah 33 verse 3, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And before I go any further, I want you to remember these two things. Watch out that no one deceives you and call unto the Lord. Both of these require absolute and total faith in Jesus Christ. And so I would like to encourage you to focus on Jesus. Focus on strengthening this muscle called faith. The Bible never says that the righteous will be saved by faith. It declares that the righteous will live by faith. Faith is not just something by which we enter into a right relationship with God. It is so much more. Faith is also what we live with every single day. It is not that we come to Christ by faith and then we live by good works. No, faith is our lifestyle as believers. We walk by faith, not by sight. And when the Bible says walk by faith, 
This means live by faith. Remember, faith is all about a relationship, and we are sustained by our relationship with the Lord. We know Him, trust Him, and have faith in Him. You don't trust someone that you don't have a relationship with. Most children don't have to worry that they won't have food to eat. They inherently trust that their parents will take care of it. In the same way, the believer does not worry about the future, but is able to rest in God. This is not to say that the believer will be free of doubt. Doubts will come, especially in life's hardest moments. But the one with faith, trusting God, will always fall back on their trust. They will always fall back on their rock and their foundation. In closing, the fool says, prove it to me, God. The believer says, Lord, let me prove myself to you. Faith is trusting that what Jesus did on the cross is all encompassing and more than you could ever need. Isn't it beautiful to know that the Lord is basically saying, my arms are always open to you. And it's with that love that he reaches out to us daily. So cast your cares upon him. Take your problems to Jesus so he can free you from your yoke of bondage. Let go and let God. Be anxious for nothing. Why? Because the Lord wants you to tell him. Jesus already has the solution to any problem we may face. He triumphed over sin. He's Lord over sickness and death, so there's no challenge that we can face that he cannot handle. He's Lord over stress and deception. There's nothing so terrible that he doesn't have the remedy for. Let him take away your worries and fears. Tell the one who promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Tell the good shepherd what's troubling your heart. I encourage you to fear not for God is with us. Be assured that he will uphold you and he will rescue you when you fall, when you take your problems to Jesus. He will strengthen you. He will give you the resilience you need, the tenacity you need to stand strong in faith. Only Jesus can empower us to overcome our challenges. Greater is he who is within me than he who is in the world. Victory is sure when we take our problems to Jesus. Don't miss out on the opportunity. Take your problems to Jesus today and you will find he's a kind and compassionate friend. Have you ever been in a place where nothing seems to be working and you know only Jesus can get you out of this place? A place where no natural resources, no doctor, no friend can get you out of this situation, but only Jesus Christ. That's where I was, <laughs> where I once stood tall and relied on my own skills, my own resources. Life took me to the feet of the Lord, asking for forgiveness, begging for mercy, I wasn't worthy, but I was still loved. I wasn't faithful, but I was still forgiven. And for anyone else who may be going through what I went through, for anyone else who may need this word of encouragement, I want to tell you that although you may be hard pressed on every side, but you're not crushed. You might be discouraged, but you're not destroyed. Although you're perplexed, you have not been driven to despair. The bottom line is, regardless of how bad or messed up you think your situation is, you are not forsaken. Remember what the word of God says about you. His plans for you are good. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So let me tell you, you are valuable. You are of more value than many sparrows. You've been saved by grace. You've been justified by faith. You see, you need to get to the point where you stop running from the call of God. There must come a time when you, as a believer, must decide, I will stand strong on my godly convictions. I will stand for forgiveness even when it's hard. I will stand in faith even when I can't see a way out. You may be under attack in your health. Maybe the attack is within your family or marriage. Even under attack, 
pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you. So I'm speaking to you, child of God. It's time to take a stand with the word of God against the forces of evil. Stand in the authority of Christ, your Savior. When you stand and wait on the Lord, he will renew your strength. He will rescue you. Seasons change. Circumstances change. People evolve. And life springs unexpected twists and turns on us. And to be honest, sometimes the season for a relationship ends or it changes very drastically. And I don't know about you, but I sure have had some relationships that I've had to walk away from that tore me to pieces. I cried, but in spite of the tears, God still said it was time to go. And then there have been relationships when others walked away from me and it did not feel good at the time. But I later found out that that was the best thing that could have happened for either of us. Now look back on your own life and just imagine how different life might have been if that relationship had remained intact. Some relationships could have truly soured and gone even further south. You wouldn't have made room for other people to enter your life and you certainly would not have experienced growth in particular areas of your life. People's expectations can hurt you before they can help you. Other people's expectations do not define you. Never allow someone's expectations to have room in your heart. So I urge you, think back on your life and see if there's a time when you experienced a transition and the pain of that thing caused you to forget the reason God had you in the earth. The reason He'd place someone in your life. The reason you're on that job. The reason he placed you in that church. The reason you're in that family. When did it get so rough that you said, (laughs) to heck with it all? When did it get so rough that you sabotaged a relationship because you were afraid of how things might turn out? When did you throw in the towel? Or who was it that you left hanging? Who was left without your attention, your guidance, your love, your friendship. Many of us in the body of Christ have experienced disappointment, heartaches, misunderstanding, loneliness, and abandonment. We placed our trust in people who were supposed to have our best interest at heart and told us that they wouldn't fail or leave us. They said that they would always be there and to call them no matter what, and they'd come through. In the end, they failed and we had to start all over again. These individuals caused us to harden our hearts to the point where layers of distrust have to be stripped away before we can love again. Some of you have been dropped. You have been hurt. Some of you have been left out to dry and seeking the mercy of others. God knows I know what it feels like to be dropped. I know what it feels like to trust someone and think that they would have my back, only to find out that they were lying all along. Some of us have experienced this with family, close friends. Truth be told, there are even some of us that feel like the Lord has dropped them. It is one of the worst feelings in the world. Beloved, I came to encourage you today and to tell you that you can and will recover from being dropped. And being dropped means you've been disappointed. You've been misled and lied to so much that you are crippled in your spirit. You put your trust in all the wrong places, people, and things. Many of you have experienced this, and it is through no fault of your own. You find yourself in a place where you're isolated, You're at war internally, smiling on the outside but crying on the inside. I said all this to say this, people of God. Through all this pain and heartache, you are not forgotten. You are not alone. God sees, hears, and knows all of your heartache. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head and the quantity of tears you have cried. He loves you and cares for you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope and a future. Don't let the enemy trick you into believing that this is the end. It is a lie. This is not the end. Your best, my best, our best is yet to come. Even though you may have been dropped and it seems like you won't ever be whole again, trust God. The Bible says in Isaiah 49, verses 14 through 16, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Let's think about this, saints of God. The Lord says that we are inscribed in the palm of his hands. That word inscribed means to write, engrave, or to make a lasting record of. God has us engraved in the palm of his hands. Not only did he inscribe us, but he died for us on the cross. He sees us every time he looks down into the palms of his hands where they hammered the very nails that hung him from the cross. The markings from those nails are the walls that are ever before him, so he simply cannot forget us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Oh, how he loves us. How much more shall our Father, Jesus Christ, bless us? How much more shall Jesus, who is just, faithful, loving, and kind, Restore our place if we continue to do his will. Your best is yet to come. God is going to fight for you and be your exceeding great reward. He will not allow his children to go without being blessed. He is a faithful God. And it is not his will that we be on the bottom of everything until we die. For I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Jesus loves us and wants to see us blessed and happy. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, verse 3, He will give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so that you may be called a tree of righteousness, so that he may be glorified. We must seek his face, praise him, and get happy for what he is about to do for us. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, verse 7, Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in the land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. So even though it may be hard, rejoice, saints of God. Your time will come, and the table will turn in your favor. Over the course of my life, I've come to understand that sooner or later, you will face opposition. We all will. And I mean, people that come against us, people that make negative comments, people who are naysayers. And no matter how good of a Christian you are, no matter how much faith you have, sooner or later, There's always one. There's always going to be someone who will attempt to discredit, undermine, or belittle you. Now, as for me, I know that if I wasn't saved, Lord knows I'd be trying to take matters into my own hands. You might have your own way of dealing with such people, but I thank God I met the Lord because when I meet a naysayer, a discourager, a holier-than-thou person, then the flesh in me, the carnal man, or rather, human nature, is to try to straighten them out and prove them wrong. But here's the thing. The way in which we think we should defend ourselves is often not God's will or way. God says, I am your defender. I am your refuge. I am your strong tower. So we think we have to defend ourselves. We think we have to defend our reputation. We think we have to make them respect us. But in doing so, we are saying, God, it's not enough that you said in your word that you will prepare a table before my enemies. It's not enough that you promised to defend me. 
I would rather take matters into my own hands. You see, if you're constantly trying to defend yourself, if you're constantly taking matters into your own hands, it will drain you. It will drain your energy. It will drain your enthusiasm. And the second thing is, if you're constantly taking matters into your own hands, you'll get distracted fighting battles that you were never supposed to fight. But may I remind you that you don't have to take matters into your own hands. God will defend you. Leave it to him to fight your battles. I had to get to a stage where I had to stop worrying about the negative comments. I had to stop getting drawn into fights, which are real distractions and energy drainers. Often it's the enemy that tries to throw up all of these conflicts. So you'll waste your time and energy involved in battles that don't matter. Yes, you may be a good person and they may be provoking you. Yes, what they're saying about you may not be true. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter how good you are, how loving or kind and upstanding. People are people and somebody somewhere is not going to like you. Someone is going to try to discredit you. This shouldn't be surprising to you because it also happened to Jesus. Despite his good works, despite the miracles, despite the large gatherings that saw people healed and made whole, Jesus still had naysayers and opposition. He did nothing but good, and yet he was falsely accused. But let me ask you, how did Jesus defend himself? How did he defend himself? He left it in God's hands. Now what about you? What happens if you leave it to God? How much more peace would you have? How much more joy would you have? God can defend you better than you can defend yourself. You don't have to try to pay people back or sort them out. The truth is, some people are never going to be for you. No matter what you do, they're never going to like you. I had to get to a stage whereby I said, Lord Jesus, I'm turning this over to you. I'm not going to spend my life worried about what someone else is saying about me. No longer will I waste my energy trying to change another person's mind, but instead I will focus on the Lord to defend me and fight for me. And when I did that, I found that whenever people try to push me down, God pulled me up. Whenever people try to push me back, my Savior pushed me forward. Those who try to discredit me and make me look bad, the Lord is ever faithful, and he turned what they meant for evil and made it for my good. So let me ask you, why don't you put your battles in God's hands? Why don't you concede and quit spending all your time trying to defend yourself? You have a defender who can protect you better than you can. He knows how to vindicate you. This is what Jesus did. He was disrespected. They called him a fraud, a cheat, and an imposter. But the scripture says he made himself of no reputation meaning he wasn't concerned about having, making a name for himself or about his reputation. And you should have the same spirit too. Let God fight the battle. Do you think he doesn't see what's happening to you? God can intervene. The more they keep talking, the more he will elevate you. The more they talk, the more God uses them as your footstool. When they think they're hurting you, the truth is God will work that for your good and eventually, you'll see that they weren't hurting you, they were helping you. The Lord will pay you back for what they're saying by taking you to new levels. That's why Psalm 23 says, he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That table that God prepares for you is only done in the presence of the ones that try to disrespect you or hold you down. They will see you in a position of honor they will see you promoted and elevated. That's your defender at work. So leave it to God. Let him fight and deal with that negativity. All the while, you place your trust in him. Philippians 4 verse 19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Wherever you're at in life, God will meet your needs. Whether you're at the peak 
of your success or at the bottom of a deep, dark pit. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was imprisoned, beaten, starved, shipwrecked. He lost his friends, his reputation, his dignity. But he counted all these things as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. And he trusted that his reward in heaven would far outweigh the things he lost here on earth. That same truth holds today. Our God is the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys. He is the God of the highs and the God of the lows. You may have just gone through the lowest point in your life, but even now, God is doing a mighty work. He might just be setting you up for an extraordinary comeback. Losses hurt, there's no doubt about that. They sting, they leave a hole in our lives where something valuable once existed, but they are only temporary. As you look back, pray that God will help you to see past the losses and anticipate the greater joy that He is preparing for you.